This week on the Backtable Podcast. First of all, I am glad to see that medical practitioners are open-minded, and I see that across the board, specifically in urology. I think that the more integrative medicine that everyone can do, the better the outcomes. And most importantly, it's really good for the patient, and it's empowering to the patient because now they're being proactive in their own well-being. So there's a psychological component there that is probably not as tangible, but really meaningful. So I think that the time is now, and we could do it in a responsible way. We could do it in a science-based way that we all keep our credibility and everything, and we do good for our patients. And there are four elements to that, right? And they all equally important. So I tell my patients, this is not a buffet. You don't get to choose what you want to leave out. This is, this is you got to do the four things. Do you have to be perfect? No. And then we, we discuss what that means. So there is physical exercise, there is diet, there is sleep, and then there's targeted nutraceuticals, right? And then each one has a certain prescriptive method. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. This is Aditya Bagrodia as your host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, Gio Espinoza from NYU Department of Urology. Welcome, Gio. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thanks so much, and it's such a pleasure to be on your podcast. No, pleasure's all mine, Gio. And um, it was just kind of an amazing way that we connected with patients seeking out providers that give prostate cancer allopathic advice, treatment, and on your end, it's so much more of the complementary side. So it was really a, a treat to get in. And maybe I'll just start out with a little story confessional. I can't tell you how many times I see patients, either they've got a family history of prostate cancer and they're wondering what they can do from a lifestyle diet perspective to minimize their risk of developing it, or they've got cancer and they've just had a recalibration of life. And they're like, doc, what do I do to keep myself as healthy as possible? And I'll admit, I usually give them a kind of a half baked, <laughs> you know, it's about moderation, try right. to really exercise, eat healthy and take care of yourself and leave it at that. And it's a little, feels a little empty. Mm. And the fact that you've really devoted your career to this, you know, studying urology at Columbia and then, and then deep, deep dive into holistic, uh, foundational urology is wonderful. So maybe just tell me a little bit about how that journey started. So, you know, my training was in naturopathic medicine, right? So it's essentially naturopathic medicine is a doctorate degree, four years, and most naturopathic doctors are not uh, specialists, right? So just a mere fact that you're a naturopathic doctor, you, you become a generalist and th there's certain principles in there where it sort of doesn't really matter what the disease is, right? Uh, um, you, you treat the person, not the disease kind of philosophy, right? Gut health is very important in naturopathic medicine because it's like the center of all health, right? Good, healthy gut equates to some degree or another to a good, healthy, uh, healthy person. Either I wasn't as smart enough as my student colleagues or I wasn't that interested in becoming a generalist. So, you know, somebody come in with Lyme disease or someone coming in with Crohn's or somebody that comes in with, you know, migraines and cancer. I, I just never felt comfortable with trying to be a jack of all trades. During my training, I got an opportunity to work with a local urologist here in Washington Heights in New York, private practice, successful practice. And one thing led to another. And then Aaron Katz at Columbia, right? He was running the Center for Holistic Urology. I said, but it, wait, what? <laughs> so then I went in there and I did a fellowship with Aaron Katz uh, for five years on, we did some research on certain nutraceuticals. And quite honestly, I learned a lot about what you guys do, right? So I learned a lot about, you know, I was in the OR uh, with a few um, surgeons. Robotic has, had just come out, sort of. And I was like, you know, so we, I was in the OR with the um, guys doing robotic surgery, open surgery, blah, blah, you know. Uh, I went to the urodynamic suite to see how that worked, PVRs, everything, right? So I got immersed really into conventional urology, not to do conventional urology, but to have a really good understanding how it works and how we can integrate with what I do. When does my, you know, so I am as biased as you are, 
right? So you must believe that if, if I, you know, when I send you a patient, right, that for the right type of patient, right, who needs surgery, they need surgery, period, end of story, right? And you're the best surgeon around for that. Obviously, yeah, there's a lot of surgeons that's arguable, but, but you, you know, with your training, you say, no, I'm the, I'm, this is what I do. So there's a bias, there's, there's an inherent bias. So for me, there is an inherent bias of, you know, natural medicine is everything, right? Lifestyle is everything. You know, you improve your lifestyle, you know, you can not only prevent things, but you could probably even cure certain things. But I wanted to be very careful with these biases. So I teach students that work with me to manage their bias, right? When will allow stuff like, you know, challenge yourself? When will your, when will your stuff not work? When will your stuff be dangerous to the patient? When do they need, you know, prostatectomy or some medical treatment? And that's what I did in five years. We published a little bit, and then I moved on uh, to run the integrative and um, holistic uh, naturopathic urology at, at NYU. So that's the history. And, uh, and uh, then it's a lot of trial and error. What really works? You know, saw palm metal. Does it really work? So I started asking a lot of questions. Curcumin, how does it work? When does it work? What dosage? You know. I went deep and, and so it's to the point now where I, I think prescriptive with, so, you know, it's not go exercise, it's what kind of exercise, how often, right? So the devil is in the detail, you know, how much broccoli, do I really need to stay away from my favorite chocolate chip cookies that I really love? How do you break the rules intelligently? What supplements do work and how does it, how, how do these supplements really work? And more importantly, as, as um, you can probably appreciate, how can I reduce the risk of dying from anything prematurely, right? So you come with prostate cancer and you're like, oh, shoot, prostate cancer. Wait a minute, you're, you're Gleason 6, but you're, you know, your LDL is super high, your HDL is super high, your triglycerides are super high. My friend, you, you could die from a heart attack, right? And, and, and so we, we kind of refocused, though I think that Prostate cancer is an excellent diagnosis for most, obviously not for all. We know that it can be deadly uh, because it gets sort of that wake up call and that opportunity to make the change. That, the, and, you know, we need to uh, be motivated, of course. Uh, so that's a great motivation. So I hope that answers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's a really cool story. And, um, you know, obviously, when you think about it as a general field, holistic medicine, it's unbelievable. Yeah. When you narrow it down somewhat to urology, it's still extremely broad. And I think for, I mean, you could think about for stone disease, BPH, yeah. et cetera, it goes on and on. And maybe just to have a little bit of focus, we'll kind of maybe run through the prostate cancer journey. And what I was sure. thinking is perhaps we, we start out with prevention yeah, and then kind of walk through disease states, um, you know, on into metastatic disease. And among those disease states, we talk a little bit about diet exercise, lifestyle, and then supplements. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, yeah, that's a great, that's a great approach for sure. You know, if I can give you a very good um, story, anecdotal story, I'm a huge fan of integrative medicine. Of course I am. But, but really the nature, I've never been a fan of us versus them. I'm, I'm purple. I'm not red or blue. I am, you know, pretty neutral religious wise. I'm just, it's just the way I see the world. I see the world holistically too. How do the different organ systems interrelate with the urological organ systems and, and, and how can, what effects, you know, does that have and how can we treat the body, not just certain parts of the body. Right. And so I, I feel the same way about integrative medicine, where it's really, a, a, in my opinion, the perfect marriage of Western medicine you know, has come a long way with a lot of research, trial and error, and natural medicine, which has come a long way, right, is the oldest form of medicine, right, thousands of years before modern medicine, people went to their backyard and looked at a plant and they just say, yeah, that plant is good for your bronchitis. They made a tea and they drank it, which was fine. It worked many times. Sometimes it didn't, right? Now we know more. We know more science behind what we're doing. In that case report that I want to mention is the following, right? So there was one case about eight years ago, where a guy came in, you know, I do a lot of prostatitis because I want to save you guys from treating prostatitis, right? <laughs> so like, bring, thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bring them on. I, I love these guys. And actually, I'm very curious as to why they have what they have. And the mind-body connection there is amazing, right? So patient comes in, he's about 38 years old. And I'm like, yeah, textbook prostatitis. He said he had it for 20 years since he was in college. And 
and I put him on a protocol, right? And, um, you know, he te- he emails me, he says, look, I- I'm doing really bad. So I changed the, I upped the dose on certain you know, curcumin, the, the certain things that upped the dose. Two days later, he's, I- I'm doing really, in fact, I-, I just came out of the bathroom crying because I'm in so much pain when I urinate and my kid is crying because he hears me cry, right? My son, right? I said, look, you, you need to be evaluated evaluated by one of our colleagues here at NYU. He gets evaluated, lo and behold, he has a urinary uh, urethral stricture. Mm. Yeah. Right? That stricture is surgically removed. This guy's living the best life of his, you know, his last 20 years that he's been suffering from this. Right? So A, it wasn't prostatitis. <laughs> B, right, it right. was something structural that needed conventional medical treatment. Now his life is amazing. And I see him all the time. He's like, thank you so much for that referral. That changed my life. Absolutely. And I think prostate cancer is in many ways the perfect disease that has such a long natural history where, you know, I I have this conversation multiple times a day. Yeah. You know, my job is not having a crystal ball and not being God, trying to figure out if it's me or prostate cancer or something else that kills you first. Yeah, correct. And when we talk about that something else, oftentimes we're talking about holistic medicine. And of course, it also, it can potentially impact prostate cancer. So let's start out with, you know, prevention. You know, folks come in, family history of prostate cancer, yeah, or they're just super motivated and they say, hey, you know, what can I do to prevent my likelihood of getting prostate cancer? Prevention. The reality is that men don't do prevention. The reality mm-hmm. is that men don't care about health. They care about performance. They only care about health to the degree that unless they're threatened with some mortal disease and now they're ready. So. I rarely see, and I do have a few patients, but maybe 1% of my practice is prevention. It's just insane that that's the case, but that's just the way it is. So once they're diagnosed, so the the three categories that I see with prostate cancer is low risk. So that means either A, active surveillance, or B, low risk, you know, but they had treatment and they're trying to prevent their recurrence. Let's dive into that. Let's start it with a very low risk or a low risk patient who's on surveillance. I was super fortunate to be at, I would consider a forward thinking institution where we actually had a clinical trial for men on active surveillance to receive curcumin and, you know, look at basically progression rates. So, you know, maybe walking through diet, lifestyle supplements, what's, what's your kind of advice and the data behind it? Right. So here's the general philosophy. So I bring some, so I'm also a functional medicine doctor. We won't go into it, but it's, it's many Uh, healthcare practitioners of all types do a specialization in science-based holistic medicine, and it's called functional medicine. So for example, Cleveland Clinic has a functional medicine department there, for example. So it's kind of gaining ground, right? It's a really, really cool stuff. So the general principles of naturopathic medicine and and functional medicine is it's not so much what's the one thing that works. It's what's the totality of things that work. So I'm not going to tell a patient, hey, just eat whatever you want, exercise, and that, that's it. Or just take curcumin. Though that kind of messes up a little bit from a scientific perspective, right? Because the scientific method is strictly about what's the one pathway and how can we interfere with, with that one pathway. My philosophy in general is what causes cancer? What causes prostate cancer? I don't know, right? It's, multifactorial likely. So let's hit this thing hard with everything. That's number one. Number two is when I send a pa- when I, when I have a patient that seen by one of our colleagues at NYU or one of our colleagues anywhere in the country, they go back uh, on active, so, you know, active surveillance, they're doing well. Sometimes there's negative biopsies subsequently. And I am super responsible, I like to think. And I don't go out, oh, I cure prostate cancer second, but we know that there's a risk of, you know, missing the tumor and blah, blah, blah. But lowering PSA, other factors much better, C-reactive inflammatory factors, his blood sugar is better and lower, hemoglobin A1C better, PSA lower, and a negative biopsy, uh, subsequently, that's a decent scenario, right, overall. So then the urologist once, you know, once says, you know, how do you cure prostate cancer? I don't know that I cure prostate cancer, right? What I'm trying to accomplish is with holistic and lifestyle measures is how can we create a hostile in micro environment. So I'm treating the micro environment. I don't treat cancer, right? The micro environment, something that's been written about extensively in the late 1800s in medical journals, you know, a seed versus soil theory, right? The seed cancer, the soil is the micro environment. 
that's what I'm trying to treat because when you have a inhospitable or hospitable in micro environment, then cancer cells will sort of have a hard time growing and spreading, which is what we're trying to avoid. So how do we do that? And there are four elements to that, right? And they all equally important. So I tell my patients, this is not a buffet. You don't get to choose what you want to leave out. This is, this is you got to do the four things. Do you have to be perfect? No. And then we, we discuss what that means. So there is physical exercise, there is diet, there is sleep, and then there's targeted nutraceuticals, right? And then each one has a certain prescriptive uh, method. So we can dive really quickly into each one. Yeah, so let's maybe start with diet. Yeah, sure. So here's what we know. Here's what I know, at least, based on my research and clinical experience. There's a lot of diets out there. And patients go into the internet and they come back, so I'm doing ketogenic diet. And I'm saying that's not the right diet to do, not for prostate cancer. I know what you read. I know the authors personally that wrote those. That's not right. Why is that? Because prostate cancer metabolically is not glycolytic. That's when when you do a PET scan that's glucose based, you can't really find it doesn't nothing comes up. But very few things come up, certainly around the, in the prostate area, maybe once it's out, but not in the prostate. Right. So it's a poor type of PET scan. Because that's the argument typically. Well, sugar feeds cancer uh, because cancer is glycolytic. And that's why PET scans, like this type of PET scan is used and you can see tumors. And I'm saying, well, that occurs with many other cancers, not with prostate cancer. So ketogenic diet can make the patient worse because it seems like uh, metabolically, prostate cancer is more lipogenic. So it uses more lipids and fats to for its fuel. Okay. Sure. So not to like pin this out, but I think we all get questions, broad strokes, cancer, does sugar make it worse? And I think it's, is it safe to say it's probably cancer dependent, but likely not terrible for prostate cancer, but also probably not great for overall health? Yeah. So we have to break that down and, the, and that's a thing. So it's, it is important to go specific and be, and be more therapeutic there. Why? Because Carbohydrates are not, right, there's a different type of, co so insulin um, resistance is an issue with prostate cancer. So yeah, when there's too much insulin that causes, that's an inflammatory response. And yes, that increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, but that also increases the risk of prostate cancer. So what type of carbohydrates, right? So a ketogenic diet is a high fat diet. It's not a high protein diet. It's a high fat. So that's why it doesn't work. Proper whole foods, carbohydrates that are whole are the right things to eat, along with a plant-based approach and along with fish, particularly salmon seems to be very good, particularly, especially. Because people ask, well, how about codfish? Well, I don't know about those, but it seems like salmon is the best. Uh, I, there's a bunch, of, a bunch of neutral other foods. Cruciferous vegetables are very important because they contain certain things in them, glucosylinates which are phytochemicals that seem to be specific to prostate cancer in terms of, you know, protecting against prostate cancer. So these are your Brussels sprouts, your broccoli, your cauliflower and things like that. So those are good food. So basically it's going to be a lot of neutral stuff, high fat, maybe not great, then a plant-based with salmon and cruciferous vegetables are, are going to be a good jumping point. Low, simple carb, Mediterranean plant-based. I have to imagine that's not going to just be for surveillance, but basically across the prostate cancer spectrum. Is that fair? So correct. So in terms of diet, with very few exceptions, that's across the spectrum. So there's two parts to it. There is uh, what to eat, and then there's also when to eat. I do think that some level of fasting or intermittent fasting has legs with regards to protection against prostate cancer, prostate cancer progression, et cetera. I do think they're, they're, they're so intermittent fasting would be, let's say, that you eat within an eight hour period, right? And you have your meals within eight hours. You probably don't need more than two meals a day. Um, and you kind of fast for 16 hours. Fasting can include water or tea or coffee without milk and sugar. So there's when to eat and what to eat. And so what to eat is exactly what we just talked about. That's great. That's a, that's a good deep dive into diet. Then maybe on the opposite end of the spectrum, let's talk a little bit about sleep. Yeah. A lot of the research indicates that, for example, the sleep hormone that comes from the pineal gland called melatonin. So there is low melatonin levels amongst prostate cancer patients with advanced disease, right? So a lot of correlation, let's be clear, mm -hmm. right? What I'm saying specifically is the following. What I'm trying to accomplish with these patients is have their immune system be strong, particularly their natural killer cells, T and T cells, right? 
good for many things, including perhaps protection against viruses and even perhaps COVID, right? But certainly good for, you know, for prostate cancer. I'm trying to reduce chronic inflammation, right? NF-kappa B and all these chronic inflammatory chemicals that seem to promote cancer. Great. What else? I am trying to reduce, uh, I'm trying to reduce insulin resistance because through insulin resistance, yeah, it promotes cardiovascular disease, but that's also not good for prostate cancer. And I'm trying to help the body detoxify. So when we talk about detoxification, what we mean is when the stuff comes in that's carcinogenic, some things we have no control over, your body should do a decent enough job to get rid of the stuff, right? Get, get rid of the, whatever it is that's in your body that's potentially carcinogenic. Because my, one of my theories is that there's definitely an environmental component to, can, to prostate cancer. So yes, there's a genetic component, but what if, what if there's no family history, they have no genetic germline mutation, but they still have, you know, Gleason 9. What's happening there? In my opinion, there's an environmental uh, aspect to it. All right. So everything I try to do tries to target those things right there. So sleep is essential, A, for immunity. So when we were in college and we were sleep deprived during exams, everybody got a cold or a flu, right? Our immune system was just not up to speed. It's important. I mean, there's been books written about this. It's just, I mean, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, I believe, is an excellent book. And that is not only prostate cancer, but it's even Alzheimer's, right? So these plaques in the brain get washed out a little bit when you get good deep sleep, right? So I'm always looking at the overall health, particularly in active surveillance, right? They're probably not going to die from prostate cancer. Um, so we're looking at their, their overall um, health for longevity purposes and functionality. So sleep, six, seven hours a night, roughly about an hour of deep sleep and REM sleep, which you can get to measure with. Uh, there's a lot of wearables that are out there now, and you can measure the quality of your sleep. And of course, and if they have nocturia, then we have to manage that because that could be a problem. Yeah, I think it's a good point. And so randomly, my wife for Christmas uh -oh. asked for a weighted blanket. Oh, you know, I was just kind of like, huh, what's that all about? So I Googled it and, you know, turns out there's sounds like some background and some rationale behind them. Any opinions on that? My kids all have weighted blankets. There's also cooling blankets, by the way. Um, I'm not sure if your wife is getting a weighted cooling blanket. They, they, they could be separate. So in order to sleep well, I mean, we can dive as deep as you want, but you need to have a cool room about 68, 70 degrees. If it's too hot, it interferes with sleep. A warm shower at night or a hot shower as, or as hot as you can make it is actually very good for sleep because your body counters the warm, right? It kind of, you know, cools your body off. Um, so that's why a nice warm shower at night relaxes muscles and things and also lowers your internal temperature so that you can sleep better. So weighted blankets, the reason why my kids have it is so that they feel more protected. No other, so it's not a cooling blanket. And I don't know if that's what, that's the purpose. And if there's any other reason, I'm not exactly sure what, magnetically or something, I'm not sure. No, that's fair. That's fair. I mean, I, I didn't get the sense that there's tremendous amount of science, but it does make sense that if you feel kind of snuggled, protected. It's not, it's a snuggling thing. Yeah. It, it, it's a snuggling as that's, that's the main reason why my kids and my kids, I mean, they, they, they all, all three of them won't sleep well without their weighted blanket. Yeah. Perfect. So I think that's, if I may, going to also kind of transcend the prostate cancer spectrum. Good sleep hygiene, maybe a warm shower, hot shower before bed, keep the room fairly cool, try to log six, seven hours, manage nocturia, very practical aspect of it. Um, is that fair? In some intermediate to more advanced cancers, I do supplement. We haven't gotten into supplements, but I do supplement with melatonin. Active surveillance, I don't. I just think that melatonin I don't know that it induces sleep. People take it for sleep. I don't know that it, it's not, it's not a sedative, but I just like this potential anti-cancer properties in melatonin. What about chamomile tea? We could have a whole podcast just on sleep, but the answer is yes. Cause I do want to go to exercise. I think exercise is really important. Totally, totally. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I'll say this. I kind of try to read my patient's personality type. So if they are type A though in New York, you know, is either type A1 or type A2, right? Sure, sure, yeah. So uh, I tell them, look, you, you, don't, you cannot just be hyperactive in sympathetic mode, right? And computer analysis, statistics, all right, 11 p.m., all right, I'm going to bed. Your brain is not going to shut off, right? So you need transition time, which is about two hours between 
daytime alert time, sympathetic time, sympathetic mode time, and nighttime restful digestion parasympathetic. You need about two hours. I'm going to have to work on that. Correct. Because, you know, the three o'clock in the morning wake up to me is you're thinking too much before going to sleep. The wake up between two to three a.m. in my subjective, a theoretical, hypothetical opinion is racing mind bef before going to bed. Your mind is not resting. You wake up two to three and then maybe you have to go pee and then you come back and you're having a hard time sleeping because you have a lot in your head. All right. All right. So I, I get it. I think, you know, we could talk about, you know, screen time before bed and, you know, it goes on and on, but blue light and things like that. Yeah. But I think, uh, I think it's, you know, just maybe to synthesize practically, it's going to be try to let your brain rest, maybe try to get in a, a warm shower if you can keep the room cool, get six or seven hours and, and um, get a weighted blanket, maybe get a weighted blanket. There <laughs> you go. Let me look. <laughs> well, right. That's it. <laughs> That's it. All right. So exercise, you know, this is a big one. And maybe with exercise, I'll ask you to just comment on like yoga, meditation, stretching as, as a part of that umbrella, if that's, if that's okay. Sure. Sure. Look, the, the question with the yeah, guy, with the guy in active surveillance is how do I cure my prostate cancer with exercise or the, the, the stuff that you give me? They, they still looking for a cure and I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm let's go for it. Right. Study just was just published not that long, but don't, don't know if you saw it. Right. Small study, uh, randomized. So men on active surveillance, one group did HIT, right? So high intensity interval training, right? The other group, the control mm -hmm. group was just a control group, right? The HIT group did HIT three times a week, right? Following for three months, no progression upon subsequent biopsy on the group that did HIT, some progression in some of the group that uh, in a control group. Then what they did is they kind of um, drew some blood from both groups poured it in a Petri dish with some cancer cell, prostate cancer cells. And they did in the group, in the exercise group, in the HIT group, uh, they saw regression of cancer cell cells in that Petri dish versus the uh, control group, which showed no regression, right? To me, you know, because sometimes people want, right, randomized trials. And I'm saying, look, <laughs> it's hard to do a randomized trial with a multi-billion dollar drug, nonetheless, with lifestyle. So that kind of information, and there's a lot of information, actually. When you look at prospective studies, showing that men after diagnosis who exercise with moderate to high intensity three hours a week die less frequently from prostate cancer in comparison to those that don't or those that kind of do brisk walking for or slow walking for 30 minutes a day, for, for, for example, or a, a week. Exercise. So how much, what do I do, et cetera. And we're still on active surveillance. So that's important because later on it changes a little bit. I have my patients go four to six hours a week because the data does suggest more is better. That's up to a certain point because then you get reduction and return on that investment, if you, if you will. So it's four to six hours a week. More than six hours, I'm not sure that you get that much benefit. And it's moderate. So it's a combination of physical exercise and physical activity. Sometimes these words are intertwined or, or they're used um, simultaneously. Physical activity really means anything, right? You get up from your sofa to go to the bathroom is phys physical activity. So that's okay, by the way. Um, I don't want to undermine any type of physical activity, but it's not physical exercise. So a fine combination of physical exercise and like walk longer, like I walk here, even if I walk and run and ride bike here all the time, right? More is better in that sense. But in terms of the physical exercise should be four hours, roughly a week with moderate intensity. So it has to be dedicated heart rate up for a period of time, or that can include high intensity interval training. It really depends on the patient's baseline, right? And how fit they are. Sure. And look, the interval training from that study was what? I mean, that's, that's so efficient. Two minutes on the treadmill, right? About 80 to 85% 80, of your maximum heart rate, right? Maximum speed, right? So uh, about 80% of your of sprinting, of your sprinting for about two minutes, uh, and then two minutes of walking. That cycle done five to eight times, you know, so that your, your workout is done, you know, in 10, 15 minutes. And there's a lot of bang mm -hmm. for your buck. And so this notion of I don't have time, you could do a nice hit workout for 10 minutes and your body thinks that you just ran for an hour. No, that's good. That's good. So what about like 10,000 steps? You know, this is something I get kind of not infrequently. Is that checking a box? Is that good? Is it bad? Where does that kind of play into this? So 10,000 steps. Look, it, it really depends. Look, 
with my patients, I'm like, what are you trying to achieve? What is it, right? Because do you want to, oh, at least I do X or do you want optimal? Optimal to me means you're an act of surveillance. We're looking for you to live longer with optimal functionality. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. How do you do better with age? Not regress with age. How do you do better as you get older? So you're 60. How can you make 70 be better than 60? By the way, this is not just me being living in a cloud. I see this all the time, right? Sure. So, sure. so it depends on what you want. It, so it, it, it what, you know, and, and your motivation. So 10,000 steps is a, it's, it's a starting point for, for many of us. And it's good. And it's a fine thing. I, I want to get my 10,000 steps every day. I actually look to get my 10,000 steps every day. And if I'm at 8,000, I may stop, you know, a couple of stops before and may walk a little bit more. But that's a starting point. In order to, you know, active surveillance, again, we're trying to make sure that you don't die from prostate cancer, but you don't die from anything else prematurely and live optimally as you age. You need to do weight resistant training. Mm -hmm. You don't have to love it, but you really need to do it. The evidence with longevity and just physical strength is it's it's pretty remarkable now, as much as one can have in terms of just actual physical strength and, you know, less sarcopenia as you get older, bone density being good for cognition. It's just it's just really good. And it becomes even more essential with men on hormone therapy for prostate cancer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was a that was a thought in my mind. Um, yeah. All right. Well, this is this is good. And I, I love the fact that it's kind of concrete and prescriptive, as you say, instead of, you know, my kind of vague, ambiguous, it's time to start exercising. Um, we've touched on diet. We've touched on exercise lifestyle. Let's get into supplements. Where do we start? Several things. Number one, if I have to prioritize, right, what's more important? Well, it's almost like asking me which one of my three kids I love most. I can answer that. I mean, that's, it's, I love them all. How can I, you know? Right. Well, it depends, right? Do you have, you know, how many kids do you have, uh, Adidia? I've got two kids. Right. So some, there's sometimes one of them is a bigger pain in the butt than the other. And he's like, <laughs> you know what? I love you a little bit less today than yesterday. But I would say that um, out of the four things that we mentioned, nutraceuticals and supplements is definitely number four. Definitely number four on the list in, in that order, right? But I do think it complements everything else very nicely. And here's why. Can you get everything for, from food? It's hard. It's hard to eat clean all the time. It really is. It's hard for me. And this is what I do for a living. I'm conscious. I'm mindful of what I eat. And it's hard for me. So let's just say, no, Doc, you know what? I, I'm doing it 90%. What does that mean? And the reason for that is because by the time we eat the broccoli, let's just say, it's not as, as nutritionally dense as it was when it was first harvested. So I go to Whole Foods, right? And it says, you know, organic apples from New Zealand. Took a hot minute to get over here. Right. Or should I have the apple that's not organic from my local farm or the farmer's market? Right. So you get more from the apple from the farmer's market or the local farm than you get from the New Zealand apple from that's organic from New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Right. The devil is in the detail. You know, I would kind of jokingly tell my patients when bringing up the curcumin study, I was like, you know, I think I'm kind of on it being an Indian and having a high turmeric based <laughs> diet. Right. But from what I'm, and of course it was kind of a joke, but right, uh, right, right. What, what I'm hearing is oh, it's probably not sufficient just to have, you know, lentil based soups with turmeric, et cetera, to, to kind of get you where you need to be. I don't know. First of all, I have to say if I'm, if I'm trying to be objective, I, I, I don't know because what you're eating in that lentil soup is turmeric. There are certain ingredients in the turmeric, one being curcumin and different types of curcuminoids that seem to have great anti-inflammatory properties and perhaps uh, some anti-cancer properties. So I don't know if there's enough curcuminoids in, in the turmeric, but I would say that there is some there. And I would say not only curcumin, but herbs and spices. For example, I'll give you an example. One of the things as it relates to eating meat, uh, red meat, is, is not only, so then things get really confused and convoluted and diets do become like religion, paleo, plant-based, and there's like fights. Just go by the evidence that exists and do the best you can, you know, with the evidence that exists. So it's not that eating red meat is bad for prostate cancer, it's the quality of the red meat and how you prepare it. So charring, there's a carcinogenic activity during the charring process and all those black markings 
that seems to be carcinogenic. First of all, so you don't want to char your meat, so you don't want it well done and you don't want it cooked in high temperature. You want it cooked in low temperature and charring as little as possible. But if you also add rosemary to it, it may reduce the amount of what's called heterocyclic amines, the HCAs, that are carcinogenic when you char meats. So there's a way of doing it that I'm not saying it helps with prostate cancer, but it's neutral. And if you want to eat a medium rare steak, eat it once a week or so. So let's get that prescription for, for the supplements. Yeah, it's... supplements. Here's the deal. What I recommend patients on active surveillance is things that are A, might have some anti-cancer properties, B, lowers chronic inflammation or lowers the risk of chronic inflammation, and, and C, good for cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular disease prevention, because I don't want to lose sight of the bigger picture, right? Sure. No prostate cancer, but you, got, you die from a heart attack. Who cares? You're still dead. This is true. So in a, in a patient with active surveillance, now in a patient with advanced disease, we have to be a little bit more hyper-focused as much as we can again, with the research that exists. But in active surveillance, we, I give them some typically vitamin D, fish oils. Uh, I do give them curcumin. I'm a huge fan of curcumin. So thank you for participating in those studies because I actually extrapolate from the studies that everybody else does and try to apply it to, to the best of my ability. So uh, some minerals include zinc, selenium. The bottom line is that a form of selenium called selenomethionine probably promotes prostate cancer. But when you combine that with selenocysteine and a few other types, almost as it as you would find in food like a Brazil nut, right? So Brazil nuts have yeah. a lot of selenium and it's not selenium methionine, it's a combination of different forms of selenium. Then that should be better, according to an old study from JAMA in 1996 showing there was reduction in people who took what's called um, selenized yeast selenium, which is the form that I think it's more beneficial. So that's the answer there. So minerals, zinc, selenium, uh, vitamin C seems to be good just for protect uh, immunity and things like that. I don't know that I have, I mean, Linus Pauling, I really, you know, I think he did fine, uh, but I don't know that vitamin C, you know, cures cancer per se in it by itself. I don't know that any one thing cures cancer. Um, so vitamin C, uh, vitamin E mixed tocopherols, not only alpha tocopherols, uh, we won't get into the weeds there, but that was what part of the problem with this electrol. How about green tea? So green tea and green tea extract and green tea consumption, correct? Yeah. So there's a, there's a, a chemical in green tea called ECGC, elogallic, whatever, and that seems to have some benefits. Um, they even looked at high-grade PIN trials, and so there's a lot of holes in that just by itself because you know, what does that really mean? Sometimes high-grade PIN never becomes prostate cancer. So anyway, uh, but it was, a human, it was a human clinical trial showing benefit from consumption of green tea and green tea uh, supplementation. The thing with green tea supplementation is the following. Very high dosages uh, increases liver enzymes. Oh, interesting. Right. So, you know, some people say more is better, right? So if a little bit of is good, more is better. No, 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 no. More is not better. Uh, and so I, you know, I tend to check uh, AST and ALT and, and patients just to make sure. Um, so, so more can increase liver enzymes. So clearly, Gio, I mean, this is, and I kind of knew it going into it. The the topic is massive and it's, <laughs> you know, there's things that are popping into my head, uh, you know, left and right. But I do definitely want to get into, you know, advanced stage disease. So maybe is it fair to say for active surveillance, we've talked about preventing progression. Similarly, in treated intermediate high risk disease, we're interested in preventing progression. And for those types of patients that have dis received definitive treatment, um, you know, of course, it's nuanced, right? If you have older, sicker patients with favorable intermediate risk, et cetera, surveillance could be a great option. And, and much of the stuff that you yeah. said applies. Is everything that you've just said for a man on active surveillance relevant to patients with treated intermediate and high-risk disease? For the most part, about 80% of it, we have to be more uh, targeted in advanced disease. Um, and I'll say why in a second. Yesterday, I saw uh, about a year ago, close to a year ago, patient of mine passed away from prostate cancer and it was just heartbreaking. So I attended his, fun his funeral on the line in Belgium. And so he, he was living here and he died there. I said to his wife, you know how it is? Like, you know, you always really, you, we, we tend to focus more on the person who died as opposed to the thousands that do are, are doing fine, right? Just the nature of maybe it is for you. It's for everybody that I've ever met. A hundred percent. Yeah. The highs are high. 
and fleeting and the lows stick with you for eternity. For eternity. And I'm, and so then I'm like, you know, Gio, you suck, right? Like, like I have the magic, everything. Like he's, you know, so 45 years old, he was diagnosed with Gleason nines. Um, and it was very advanced. Um, and, uh, he died at the age of 52. And, you know, I said, I said to her, look, I, the way it is in my world, and, and it's not unique to me as any practitioner, the ones who die, they stay with you. And so I'm, I'm sorry. She's like, Gio, Gio, Jan's quality of life was amazing in those seven years. They were amazing. Like right to the last day, almost. Mm -hmm. Gio, look, everything he did worked. And so then she brought a, a different perspective, right? So men with advanced prostate cancer, there are two things I'm trying to accomplish. The primary thing is not necessarily prostate cancer is, or is related to prostate cancer. It's related to not dying from things like hormone therapy. Yeah, exactly. Right? So metabolic syndrome. I'm trying to prevent metabolic syndrome. I'm trying to prevent a heart attack. I'm trying to prevent osteosporosis. So that's exactly what I'm trying to do. And I'm very prescriptive. So dietarily, what's the difference? You got to be a little bit more compliant than the guy in active surveillance. The guy in active surveillance can have a couple of pizzas a week and, and it's fine. You may be able to have one. I want you to live. I want you to enjoy life and not eat with guilt, but you may not have a lot of wiggle room, right? Mm -hmm. Exercise. You do have to do weight resistance strength training is not negotiable. And a lot of the guys, a few researchers in Australia are looking at this when men, even with bone mets. So even men with bone net mets, I have them do weight resistant exercise in a specific way so that they don't. But the notion that they may break a bone by doing this is completely theoretical and probably not the best advice. So a couple of specific questions. Um, calcium. Yeah. I don't recommend a lot of calcium. Look, across the board, including men on hormone therapy, women after menopause, men after a certain age. The number one thing to do for bone density is strength training, period, end of story. Not only that, calcium is a problem if you're not exercising and doing both, because a lot of calcium in the stream causes hardening of arteries and all kinds of other issues. So too much calcium is a problem. And so you only get enough calcium in the bone when you're stressing the bone. That's the only way you get calcium. And if not, it's not going in the bone. Right. <laughs> So I don't recommend a lot of calcium from supplements, actually. I recommend a little bit, but not a lot from supplements, no. Okay, okay. Just a kind of a specific question, management of hot flashes. So I, there's two things I do for that. One is acupuncture, and I'm also an acupuncturist, and there seems to be benefit there. So you may want to be friends with a local ac acupuncturist, and there's tons in San Diego. And black cohosh about 500 milligrams is a herb that women with menopause uh, take. And I'm saying, well, is it phytoestrogenic? Because I don't want to induce phyto. No, it has nothing to do with phytoestrogenic, actually. So it's in, in the t temperature section of the brain. It seems to work very nicely. Black cohosh in that scenario. Those are the two things that I find to be helpful. So here's the thing. Remember, so we said what? Sleep is important. Well, these hot flashes at night is, is tough for these guys. So I have them take several things at night that includes magnesium, a couple of other botanicals that are good for sleep, and black cohosh at night. And I think that's been remarkable for patients. So really, it sounds like the, the main emphasis is going to be strength training has got to be ultra prioritized, that um, really close compliance adherence to the diet is now kind of not, it's gone from preferable to mandatory. And then yeah. um, a couple of other augments for sleep optimization. Yeah. Again, it's like choosing my favorite kid, right? It, it, it's tough because if you're not careful, you are going to get fatter and, you know, gain weight when you're on ADT, right? You just are. So you have to be careful with diet. So it's always the first three is always, you know, and we can talk, discuss, and even argue about what's most important, but your assertion of exercise being most important, honestly, again, it's like, if you put a gun in my head, but I think is most important across the board, actually. It may be. That's an arguable statement. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, the next time a patient asks me, doc, what can I do to like minimize the chances that I can control from, from my prostate cancer going gangbusters instead of my lukewarm, vague, you know, really focus <laughs> on diet and exercise. I think I'll be able to come up, come across. And so here's, here's, here's going to be my spiel, Gio, yeah. and I want you to kind of critique it. <laughs> All 
All right, so this is all going to be really important. I'm going to break it down into four aspects. Diet, you want to be cognizant to what you're eating. Mm -hmm. Cruciferous vegetables, try to watch the ultra fatty foods. Salmon would be a good supplement, a good regular to have in your diet. Mm -hmm. Exercise, let's try to get three to four hours in a fairly intensive training several times a week, and then also maintain a good bit of activity throughout the day. Sleep-wise, we're trying to get six to seven hours. If you can do that, fantastic. Try to maybe relax your mind a couple hours before sleeping. If you feel like melatonin um, may help you, that would be a reasonable option. If you're on ADT, mel melatonin plus magnesium and some black cohosh may help you get through the night. And then finally, with respect to supplements, that would be a little bit harder for me at this stage of my life to remember every one. But um, look, if you go curcumin, vitamin, yeah, vitamin D makes sense and curcumin makes sense. Downside with curcumin, you don't really have to worry, worry about overdosing. They've done trials with even up to 8,000, 8 grams a day, which nobody got, never prescribed that. Very little downside with curcumin. Is, is that going to be a, a decent little, you know, end of the visit, new cancer diagnosis, a one minute spiel? That's going to take you 10 minutes of your time with that one patient. You have 30 patients a day and then they're going to ask you questions about what you just said and be more specific. Look, what I think I want to do and what I'm planning to do in 2022 is have online courses for healthcare practitioners, not so much for the urologist, because I think that you guys should continue to do what you do and what you're good at. But your NP, your PA, they can have this discussion, your nurse, they can have this discussion with them and be very specific. And I think that'll, that'll be a, a game changer. So that's what I'm working on. Yeah, no, and I mean, I, I imagine like most things, you got to hear the message from multiple different people in multiple different ways. Yeah. And if I see a new bladder cancer guy, do you smoke? Yes, you got to quit smoking. Right. You need help smoking? Right. Maybe, okay, I'm going to have you see our smoking cessation team. Right. But at least they've heard something from me. It's been prioritized for me. And if I can kind of convey that same 100%. degree of a message from a lifestyle perspective, I think it's valuable. And, you know, on the flip side, not all patients have the luxury of, seeking medical attention for their lifestyle. So if they can get something to kind of start with, and, you know, by all means, you know, you've, you've got a really nice uh, fleshed out bit of information on your website and so forth, um, which I think is, you know, actually a, quite a, a valuable resource. And looking forward to your podcasts that you're starting up to, to really kind of dig into the weeds oh, on yeah. this um, coming up in the new year. Too. Yeah, thank you. So maybe I'll just uh, ask you to kind of give a, a word of wisdom to our readership as we come almost on an hour now. Yeah, I think a summary is, is the following. First of all, I'm glad to see that medical practitioners are open-minded, and I see that across the board, specifically in urology. I feel like at the AUA that uh, some of our friends and colleagues are coming out of the closet when they find out what I'm doing. They pull me aside. Wait, what, what is it that you do? Can I? do some of that? Like, how does that, you know, it's almost like they've been in the closet for so long and now they, now it's coming out and now they're like wanting to learn more. And so I think that, that things have changed certainly in urology and there, there's an open-mindedness about it. I think that the more integrative medicine that everyone can do, the better the outcomes, the more you can integrate, right? I have specific protocols for men before they go on the prostatectomy. This includes pelvic exercises. We try to strengthen the external urethral sphincter. This includes some supplements, even throughout. Because I know you guys would say, and then as, um, you know, stay, stay away from all supplements because you don't want to eat blood thinners, but some of them are not blood thinners that can actually be beneficial and things like that. So the more integrated A, and most importantly, is really good for the patient. And it's empowering to the patient because now they're being proactive in their own well being. So there's a psychological component there that is probably not as tangible, but really meaningful. And lastly, I think the audience, I think the layperson, I think the patient wants that. So you're gonna, the more open-minded you are, for example, every time you say, look, diet this, these supplements, they're gonna tell their friend, it's like, oh no, this guy is really, you know, this guy, because they, they, they wanna know that you're open-minded to this and not poo-pooing it. So I think that the time is now, and we could do it in a responsible way, we could do it in a science-based way that we all keep our credibility and everything and we do good for our patients. So that's the, that's the takeaway. I love it. I love it. Well, we'll call it a day at that. Gio, <laughs> thank you again. I appreciate your time and your, and your candor. Likewise. Thank you. And, you know, look forward to what comes through from your uh, neck of the woods moving forward. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you.